broadcasting this from my iPad uh, today, so this is why the screen will look a little bit different, but it should not affect what we will be teaching or going through. And um, uh, I will enlarge the pictures as we go along. And today is a session for frozen section. And uh, there is a group of cases here that we are going to go through as many as we can. Probably I have like 20 cases or more that's ready for two or three different system. And we will see how that will work. And um, if we find out time, we will be able to continue. If not, we can always uh, uh, do an extra session uh, for this next week. So before I start uh, the frozen section, I just would like to tell you, especially for those who are sitting the, going to sit the exam for the first time, how the frozen section work. Of course, the order of, uh, of uh, 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 that part of the exam will include frozen section. You will have, you will have the OSPI sessions, you will have uh, the management scenarios, uh, and um, and the the written OSPI, of course. The the thing is that they don't have a sequence of arrangement. So, but what the 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 center will try to do is to give you the two theory sessions of frozen section, and this each one will usually last for about twenty minutes. So you sit for 20 minutes, you get past three slides with the history. And then after the 20 minutes, they take these three slides from you and they give you another three slides uh, for frozen sections together with their history. So in total, you will be examined on six cases. You have uh, the time allowance is about six minutes and, uh, and 30 seconds for every case to make up your mind and you look and you make a note. So you make a note with the case number and the answer. And, and um, uh, what it is that then after that you will be called uh, to sit in front of the two, of two examiners. And the two examiners will, will be uh, telling you, okay, so tell us what you, what is your, uh, diagnosis. Now, this is a, 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 a scenario where you need to be aware how the college is building that up. The college is trying to mimic exactly the real scenario that you have in your lab between you and the state. So, of course, the examiner will be allowed to do, ask you some uh, uh, um, histology questions if they wish, right? So, but this is not the issue here. The issue is that if they are to, uh, if they are to uh, basically um, issue, you know, ask you histological questions, you are supposed to answer. But the real scenario is that they are pretending to be the surgeon, okay? So they will ask you the question or case number one. So you say case number one, for example, was a section taken from the kidney and this represent that, right? Uh, now, what will happen that the, the sometimes the examiner will, will ask you, okay, what's number two? And then what's number three, number four, five, and six? And that's it. You see? So sometimes what will happen that after you answered the six questions inside the station or inside the, in front of the two examiners, then they tell you, thank you very much. And they let you go. Okay? So there is, there is one or two of two scenario uh, uh, that our, our outcomes that can come out of this. The first one is that you may have given all the answers correct and this is what we all wish for. Or the opposite scenario is you probably gave five answers or six answers wrong. 
and then the examiners think that there is no point. Okay, there is no point because uh, there is no way that they can bring you back from from what you've digged to yourself inside this station now. Okay, if you have uh, let's say four answers out of the six or five answers or six answers wrong, then they probably will not this open any discussion so they will let you go so but you will know roughly how did you do because if you have no clue and you have not been uh, told any you know no open discussion whatsoever then then that will will be the scenario of course the the problem here of the frozen section that it is variable between individuals which means that some individuals are very confident, uh, you know, some doctors are very confident in giving the answer, while some others are a little bit less confident. And you will, will, uh, we, you will, you will have to categorize yourself and try to build on this confidence for frozen section as you proceed or you approach to uh, closer to the exam because if you completely lack confidence with the frozen section it will you will be exposed on this station and you will have a big problem uh, now the options are that you will either say that this is a malignant and you give some kind of idea what type of malignancy this might be or you will say it is benign or inflammatory okay which is under the benign category of course but you will specify which benign you mean. Is it benign neoplasm or benign inflammatory or benign benign, like benign normal tissue? And the third option, which is the defer, which is the people get very confused about it. And I saw over the last few years, a lot of people fail because they do not understand what do we mean by the word defer. Defer means that you you cannot make up your mind, yes, and but it has to be justified. So cannot make up your mind. This is not something that you you just because you felt that you cannot make your mind. No, it doesn't work that way. Defer means that there are certain scenarios which unfortunately it is nearly impossible to judge it on a frozen section. For example, if you are to deal with a spindle cell neoplasm, okay? All what you can say, this is a spindle cell tumor and I'm going to defer it, right? Because in the frozen section, the atypia can be overcalled, as you know, and you might not see mitosis and you might not be seeing any necrosis, which are the three characteristic signs for diagnosing a spindle cell uh, 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 tumor as benign or malignant. And don't forget as well that you have the intermediate category like solitary fibrous tumor, for example, which will lie in the middle. So sometimes there will be situations where you don't know. You, I remember in my uh, exam, in my frozen section, I did have a lung section with lymphoid infiltrate. Okay, now I say, I said there is no epithelial malignancy. However, this is a lymphoid rich section. I will have to defer it to the immunohistochemistry because I um need to uh, get more information out of this so the you might provoke the examiner then by by saying something like what i said and they said so do you think it is benign or malignant so you say i all what i can say now this is a lymphoid which uh, lymphoproliferative disorder cannot be excluded i am going to defer the case for the paraffin section and do immunohistochemistry on this. This is a, a scenario of deferral, for example, okay? So uh, another scenario to defer, if for example, you have 
uh, an ulcer, like let's say a stomach ulcer or esophageal ulcer, and the the next to that you find a few uh, atypical glands. You don't know if these are reactive or these are a dysplastic or are they a tumor. You really don't know. You just see them very adjacent to the ulcer. And we all know that a case like this is very difficult anyway to judge it on the, the standard h &E. So on frozen section, this also will be quite tricky to, to judge. So this is, this is a, another scenario where you say, I saw the ulcer. I um, saw some atypical glands. However, this may be reactive, may be neoplastic. I need to assess this uh, on the paraffin section and I probably need uh, more tissue, you see? So uh, this will lead us to another uh, 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 scenario that uh, for, for the deferral, okay? So they might tell you, okay, so what do you want me to do, okay? So you can tell them, don't forget you are talking to the surgeon, you're not talking to a pathologist. So you say, it's not up for me to decide for you what to do. However, I may do some extra levels. I might see some more infiltrative neoplastic glands if you wish to wait. I, the other things, if you feel that you have a definite tumor, then uh, I will, um, uh, 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 I, I, you can send me more material, you see, which is a real, uh, this is a real uh, scenario. Um, no, you, I have a question here to say, if you have a spindle cell lesion in the lung, do we defer? Uh, as it can be a benign like SFT. But, well, the thing is that you are not particularly deferring the case. Remember, you have given a diagnosis. So providing that you were able to say this is not a scar or this is not a fibrous tissue and this is not a small cell carcinoma, this is not non-small cell carcinoma, then you are able then to, to say Yes, this is this is a neoplastic tissue. Uh, it's a spindle cell neoplasm. Uh, we cannot characterize it further based on these sessions. We need to examine it more to decide and determine if this is benign or malignant and to be able to subtype the different line of differentiation. Uh, don't forget that spindle cell is not only mesenchymal in lung. You have the, the new WHO uh, which has categorized spindle cell carcinoma as a separate entity tumor that's not related to your squamous cell carcinoma. This is goes under the category of pleomorphic and spindle cell carcinoma category, which is a new category in the lung that we do use. Uh, don't forget as well that in the lung, you also have mesothelial proliferation, which can be the spindle, the spindle, not the epithelioid uh, subtype. So if you have the spindle mesothelioma, then it's still in the differential. And this is why you, you cannot, but at least you were able to tell the clinician, you are not dealing with a small cell or, or, or non-small cell carcinoma, you are dealing with a spindle cell neoplasm that cannot be further characterized. Obviously, if you are able to say that this is malignant because you saw a lot of uh, bizarre atypia and you saw a lot of mitotic, abnormal mitotic activity within this spindle cell neoplasm, then there is nothing to stop you from calling it malignant spindle cell neoplasm, right? So, but again, that's as far as you will take it. And then you will say defer. Right, so the the clinician sometimes, uh, sorry, the, the examiner sometimes might provoke a question. Uh, uh, so what do you want me to do next? Okay, because you're not telling me if this is benign or malignant. Well, you have to be firm 
and abide to what you have said, okay? Uh, can't you just, uh, they might ask you, can't you just tell me, okay, any line of differentiation, does it look neuronal, does it look mesothelium, does it look like a spindle cell carcinoma? You have to, don't get dragged into this scenario or discussion. What you really need to, to say, I cannot tell you more than this is a spindle cell neoplasm. Yes, absolutely. If you think that you have enough atypia, mitosis, necrosis, and things, and you uh, want to call it, um, um, if you want to call it uh, benign, uh, so if you want to call it malignant spindle cell neoplasm, that's absolutely fine. But uh, uh, this is the this is as far as you can go. Okay, this is as far as you can go, and there is no there is no point in arguing it. I told you before in the first early in the second session when we were discussing some of one of the soft tissue examples, you will be mad to diagnose a a rhabdomyosarcoma, for example, or a leiomyosarcoma without amino, even if it looks like so. Okay, so these are things that you need to be aware of into these uh, uh, scenarios. Don't get dragged into this discussion. Only answer the questions if they are histologically relevant. So what I mean by this, that if the pathologist and they shouldn't do, but some of them do. If the pathologist asking you why you are calling this malignant, yeah, it is either there, there is there is one of two things behind that question. Okay, of course he is going the path the examiner now is going out of the parameter that he was given out of the space that he was supposed to stay within, and there is one of two things either that you have been uh, uh, on the cautious side or, or like uh, or, or overcalling. So he just wanted you to maybe revise your answer and or he wants you to make sure that because you have done one mistake in the, in the six, so he just wanted to make sure that you have en enough knowledge in one or two of the very difficult cases to let it go, to let that one mistake go and then you can pass. Usually if you if you fail one, you can pass. If you fail two, it depends. What is the effect of the management that, that will be? Like for example, in that uh, lymph uh, lymphoid infiltrate example, if you call it lymphoma directly, then even it might be lymphoma, but you you haven't taken the right procedures for frozen section because frozen section is still a technique and is still a limitation and you should not try to jump the queue to show how clever you are. It is frozen section is about how safe pathologists we are in our practice, not about how clever we are. No one I, in my practice I never, I can tell you that I never had a problem with in my, that's real life now. If I called something negative and on deeper level, I found a nest of tumor because this is not uncommon. You can see that. You can see a group of cells that you felt it, they are benign, but they tend to be malignant. And, but this is not going to change anything from what has happened, you know? And the surgeon doesn't feel that he's been let down by, my, by me or anything. So in real life is different, of course, but in the exam, yes, you need to try to get these six answers correct. Um, don't try to, after the exam, to correct this with your, with your colleagues because maybe they will be wrong, which is usually the case. So just keep your answers for yourself for frozen section and wish for the best. No one knows the discussion that happened between you and the examiner except you. And out of this discussion, they might do that. The other thing says the examiner sometimes give you the surprise face. And the, the both of them 
seriously, really? Are you sure? Uh, you know, they, they, they keep telling you that. And uh, for those who were on the borderline, they might say, yeah, I think it is. But what it is that you are not, apart from this uh, ultra scenario that I told you about, because that's a common but real life situation where you can't and you have to defer or do levels or they can send you more, you, you're not supposed to tell me uh, there is a TPI, I cannot determine if it is benign or malignant. You can't say that. You cannot play that game in the real exam. It is either benign, malignant, or defer. And if you are deferring, you have to tell me why. If you are going to call something atypical, but not cancer, you must have a very good reason, like next to an ulcer, a lot of acute inflammation present, uh, or just a atypia that's very focal, okay? So these are scenarios which are different from, and, and you're not going to, to be hit by these three scenarios. And yes, you will be allowed then to defer, providing that you tell me what it is. But there are situations where you cannot play that game, especially if we are talking about a ureteric margin, for example, a very big operation radical nephrectomy. And you are saying, oh, I am not sure this if urethelium might be dysplastic. Oh, it might be, just be reactive. I'm really not sure. Uh, I am going to defer it for paraffin. No, that's wrong. Okay, this is this is completely wrong. This is not a situation where you will be able to defer. This is a situation where you have to use all the knowledge that you built about the the urethelial or or TCC cancer, and try to put it and input it in the frozen section, and go along with this. But we will encounter more uh, scenarios here and we will see. So th let's go to the first case. And uh, these are like slides, but uh, they are taking a different magnification and you will be able, I will be moving it and you will be able to see. But first, let's see the history. So the history say that there is a kidney that's potential transplant kidney. And uh, before the, the, the surgeon do the surgery, basically they assess the kidney to make sure that there are no lesions. He saw a nodule uh, on, on, the, on the transplant kidney and he sent it for the, the frozen section. So this is a section from kidney and obviously it doesn't look right, okay? It is a lot of spaces, uh, sister like structures that's present in the middle. So at this power magnification, this is all what you see, but you can identify the structures which you have. So you have uh, basically the, the um, you, you do have the, the capsule with the, the large vessels, or this might be sometimes, because this was a, a pepper nodule, don't forget, and this is a subcapsular uh, type of tumor or, 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 or just a collection of ducts, which you can see at this power. But it is good to know the location, the orientation. As I said, if you have a skin, if you have an oral mucosa biopsy, if you have a gastric or esophageal, just make sure that you, you, you look to see if there is any ulcer that you might see or not. We will move now to a little bit of a higher power magnification into this case. And yes, you can see there is a, a little bit of a, of a, of a tubular and maybe uh, uh, I, will, I will stick to the tubular because this is a term that we are familiar with in the kidney territory. So there is a tubular proliferation. There are some large, some small and, um, and um, that's all what we can say into these magnifications. And um, we don't see glomeruli. Uh, so this is another uh, uh, thing that you can spot. Maybe one here. Yes, there is one here. You can see that, you can spot that glomeruli here around the vestibule. But in, in the actual lump here, 
uh, or, or this this uh, cystically dilated tubules, there is no there is no glomeruli. So the glomeruli just present on the periphery at where I would consider that this is my zone of normality. Okay, so I will just show you more areas. This is the glomeruli at a higher magnification. Um, you need to be familiar with how it looks like, of course, on frozen section because it can be uh, very misleading in biopsies as well. Uh, I came across one case before where if you focus on this glomeruli in the corner of the page on the biopsy in the paraffin section, all what you can see is tubules and they saw this part here on that core biopsy and I saw some of the pathologists did call it maybe renal cell carcinoma. There are some clear cells, but uh, just be aware if you're not very familiar with this funny look of the glomeruli that it can look very funny when it's squashed in biopsy and it is cut thick. <coughs> oh, excuse me, sorry, thank you. So I will, uh, uh, we, we are still here in the middle of uh, this field, so you can see there are some uh, dilated tubules and I'm going now to move in into uh, another scenario here, which is uh, another field, which we can start now seeing the cells a little bit at a higher magnification. So they are lining these tubules, but some of them, interestingly enough, not particularly forming tubules, and you start to see that they are kind of nested a little bit. So this architectural arrangement is important because um, it can be tricky and different. The things is that as well that you need to appreciate that there is uh, some interconnecting things between these nest and tubules structures. So they are more uh, like uh, I would describe it more as trabeculated, you know, and this, uh, when, when these tubular like structures start to interconnect, then it's better to call them uh, trabeculated structures. The, you can see that some of these uh, cystic spaces are not particularly lined by the single cell, which are uh, like what you see normally in the tubules. Some of them are lined by by multiple layers. So some of them are multi-layered. Uh, you can see them across the board. They can be multi-layered here and there everywhere. So this is another uh, uh, observation that you will have to pay attention to. And uh, these are a little bit uh, close up on this type of cells so that you can see. Uh, the cells looks a little bit, uh, I would say, monotonous. And you can see that surrounding these cells, there is a lot of, uh, uh, um, or oh, there is there is a cytoplasm that's not clear. So at least uh, I I can uh, say that with some degree of confidence that probably these are not uh, clear cells in a way. And uh, majority of you might agree that in a field like here, what we see now in the middle of the field that these cells are not particularly, uh, 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 they have eosinophilic cytoplasm. And then, and then um, we, I just will show you uh, one of more two views. And um, then I would like you to also uh, pay attention to the background a little bit here in this slide over there. And uh, again, um the just the more more and more of this uh, section okay so now based on what you we saw into this case what are you going to do do you have you remember we have three situations now this kidney there are two patients lying down in the anesthetic room the recipient and the donor and this is the donor kidney and it has got this lesion, and they are asking you now, what are you going to do? 
So now what is, what are you going to do for a situation like this? You know, are you going to give me a benign diagnosis, a malignant diagnosis, uncertain diagnosis with differential, or are you going, which means that you ultimately you will defer. So this is what you, you we will be uh, going through. So uh, some of you said oncocytoma. Uh, do the majority agree with this? Just uh, say yes or no or, or okay. So we have uh, some agreement on that, okay? So this is a, a very uh, a straight uh, forward case um, for, 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 and this is the easiest. So I thought that to start the session with easy case because I wanted you to, to, to one thing you need to appreciate in this case that it is the, the background is very important. Now, uh, it is in, in the renal cell carcinoma, majority of the renal cell carcinoma will have a necrosis in the background and they will be kind of tightly packed uh, while in, in this one, they are not. Uh, they are very loose and you tend to get this loose stroma, which can sometimes be mixoid. The, the cells uh, are important to differentiate between, of course, the chromophobe, because the main, you have three options here in your mind has to be when you are dealing with this case, okay? So if you, if any of you who said yes, and did not consider the three options while you are looking into this case, then you, you will fail the case in the exam. Okay, I'm telling you now, right? Because you can have the isinophilic variants of the clear cell, okay? This is in the differential diagnosis, which can also have tubules. Yes, can have tubules and the, the arrangement. Uh, the, the clear cell carcinoma can have a tubular array and, and the microcystic arrangement, which is, is one of the morphological spectrum that you see with a clear cell. The second one is the chromophobe, and you definitely have to consider it. And you know that in real life, sometimes it's even difficult to differentiate the chromophobe with, from oncocytoma and in, the, in, in, in some type of tumor, you have a hybrid. You have all the chromophobe and you have uh, the, the oncocytoma sitting next to each other, which we call it a hybrid tumor. And then the, the third one is, of course, the oncocytoma, which is important. But yes, the edematous or mix, slightly myxoid stroma will go the other things as well that the, the other two, the clear cells and the chromophobe tends to have a clear new, uh, cytoplasmic boundaries between the cell. And of course, you all know about the racinoid nucleoli for the chromophobe and the binucleation characteristic that you tend to see with the chromophobe, which we did not have in any of the sections which I have shown these are very monomorphic nuclei. They are very round, very clear cut nuclear membranes. And yes, by all means, this is the oncocytoma. So, so if I ask you, okay, what should we do next? Uh, can any of you, one of you tell me what, uh, what, uh, what he, will, he or she will answer this question? So now the examiner is telling you, okay, so oncocytoma, what do you want me to do next? So tell me, just give me an example of the answer that you might give in the exam. Okay, some of you said this is a clinical decision. Some of you wrote CK7, any more? Yeah. Okay. No, you don't. You don't decide to proceed with a transplant. Yes, this is what I was waiting for. Okay. 
<laughs> right. Listen, I was waiting for this. Some of you said defer for histology for final diagnosis. No, you cannot defer, right? Because because what happened if you if you know uh, what will, what has happened, this patient the recipient is already now immunosuppressed, okay? And you don't decide, right? The bottom line is we don't wait for the paraffin. Okay, if you if you you are you are quite confident that this is an oncocytoma, so to defer it for paraffin after you said it's oncocytoma as well. You tell the surgeon, as some of you said, I think this is a benign tumor, which is oncocytoma. Okay, either you proceed with surgery or not. It is up to you. Okay. I am not in a place here to decide more than what I have told you. This is an oncocytoma, which is a benign tumor. No, no, don't say good prognosis or bad prognosis or anything. You don't know, right? Because do you know where is it? Do you know if it is compressing on, on the renal pelvis or not? Some oncocytoma can be seven or eight centimeters. Yes, this is not something for us to decide. Uh, some of the oncocytoma can be multifocal and then the surgeon might say, oh, one focus is oncocytoma, all the other nodules must be the same. You don't, you do, don't dig this. You see, this is what I wanted you guys to learn. Okay, you can, you have the chat room in front of you and, and you can see that we, we, we are very keen to give information as pathologists, but in the exam, you stick to the script, okay? Don't, you, like in cinema, not in theater, you know? In theater, the, the, the actor will go out of script if he or she wants, but in movies, they have to stick to the script and consider it like a movie. And you say, this is a benign tumor. It is up to you to decide what you will do next. Okay, that's it, right? That's it. No, the hybrid tumor is a rare thing and you didn't see it in this section, yes? So some of you asking about the hybrid tumor, or oh, can it be hybrid? No, the hybrid tumor will be two different tumor looking, but present next uh, to each other. It's like collagen type tumor. Uh, you, you see the nuclear features and you see the, the, the things. But what I, what I would suggest, to you guys now that you write in, in your answer sheet. They will give you a booklet, by the way. So you write your answer and you can take this booklet with you in the exam, of course, in front of the examiner. So next to the case, for example, you got this one and you did call it oncocytoma. So next to it, what I want you to, to do is to say uh, benign, it's up to you. <laughs> okay, so write, write this. So if they try to drag you into anything, uh, like for example, uh, the, 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 the histologist might tell you, uh, sorry, the, the examiner might tell you that in actual fact, are you sure? Because we, I understand from my practice that you only diagnose oncocytoma after doing a panel of immunostochemistry. Okay, no, no, that's not the case. If the case is, is like this one with a lot of this uh, stroma that you see in the middle of the field, in, in this case, yeah, some of you might do the immunostochemistry to confirm, but uh, a lot of us will not do, you know, like we'll, we'll say, okay, it's oncocytoma, oncocytoma is oncocytoma, you know, what do you want me to do? Okay, but yes, on the caution side in, in real life, some people in some practices will do the CD117 and CK7 and the, the CD10 as, as a little panel to, to make sure that the differentiated the three is an ophilic tumor that can come. Of course, I did not include the papillary because this tumor was not particularly papillary uh, carcinoma, but the papillary carcinoma as well can look as an ophilic. Uh, uh, but what, what it is, what, or what is the learning point here? Uh, 
no, 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 you're not going to do immuno. So some said immuno will take time. No, no. The, doing immuno means that you are going to defer the case. Okay? In the immuno, to do immuno in the exam, in the frozen section, it only means one thing, that you are telling the examiner, I am deferring the case to paraffin section. Okay? For a case like this, we are not going to defer it. This is absolutely fine and we are happy with it and uh, we go for oncocytoma. But what I have tried to tell you that how your mind can play up. You know, even you, some of you said proceed for transplant. It's not my decision. Okay, it's not my decision. And you don't know the recipient might be still awake in the anesthetic room. So the surgeon goes to, the, to him and say, we've got this tumor, we, we, which uh, the pathologist think it is benign. Uh, of course, it is, it's just a frozen section. Any frozen section in the world has some sort of uncertainty, but the pathologist think it is frozen section. And what do you want us to do? So the recipient might reject the surgery. So it's not up to us. You see, this is what I mean. But anyway, we will go to another case. This is another case now. You can see it on the screen. This is another kidney case. This is a potential transplant kidney again. The surgeons notice the nodule and send it for frozen section. Okay? Uh, no, you cannot suggest to consult an oncologist. Don't suggest anything. Okay, you are not a place, you are, you are in the place to say right, wrong, left, right. Okay, that's it. Okay, frozen section is different from any other situation. Don't suggest. Okay, so just for, for people to say suggest to oncologists, no. Okay, so let's, let's just focus on this case now. Uh, um, so so the, the case here, we have, we have uh, this, uh, this is the section which you can see sometimes it can be horrible. A lot of uh, cutting artifacts, of course, because it depends on your machine and uh, the type of tissue that you are receiving. So we will go to a little bit higher magnification. I told you, you try to determine where exactly you are. And we are, I am going from uh, uh, right to left here and it is still uh, difficult to determine anything. You still wait, wait and see because uh, what it is, okay, I cannot determine anything on this, but what I can, if I waited a little bit more, I might say, okay, there might be some tubules here in the corner. I might be, um, I might be dealing with with um, with this problem, you know, like there is a problem here that I might dealing be dealing with, which is uh, the, 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 the some renal tissue on one side, but in the middle, I'm not appreciating a lot of renal tissue. So try to gather the maximum uh, amount of information. And then uh, we go to a little bit of a higher power into the center of these fields and uh, uh, you have to be careful because uh, there are structures here on the on the on the corner which we are not sure what they are uh, are they are fat cells we don't know really what these uh, these things are so uh, one of the things in frozen section that i do find difficult is uh, the, to, to define that if there is a definitely uh, a fat cells or not, but uh, it, it can be quite deceiving because you, you can go uh, along there and there and then uh, decide, okay, there are some uh, spaces which you might look like a vessels, some, uh, some maybe some fat, but look, we, we go to more areas that, and this is one of the things that you need to appreciate when you look at frozen section, that there are some uh, areas in, 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 the, in the, or some part of your, 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 your section 
will be better fixed than other part. And this is the nature of it. So if I go here into an area like here, I, I don't see a good fixation uh, here as well into that corner. I don't see a good fixation. And then I, I move along. So, and I am moving along again. And then I started to see uh, some uh, kind of, uh, of a better fixation here into these areas. Uh, one thing I, I would ask you to appreciate at this power is the Arctic architecture. You know, there is there are nests and there are vascular trabecuri that is dividing these nests. And this is the value of the, the low power. And as I stressed on it on the H&E, I'm stressing on it again in the frozen section. You need number one to decide what tissue you are really dealing with. And secondly, you need to decide that uh, if, you, if you really have uh, uh, um, a, an architecture that you can fit the, what you are seeing into it. And uh, the, yes, now you start to see the higher power in the good fixed areas. And of, obviously, if I stay in an areas like here, it will be very difficult. But this was majority of the field uh, in the areas that I showed you at low power did show this. You can't call it. You need to find the architecture, the correct architecture in order to call it. You remember I told you a minute ago that the, the, there is a very distinct cell membrane in the clear cell and in the chromophobe. And you can even on frozen section, in a section that's not very well fixed like that one that you see in the screen now, you are able to see that there are some this very clear uh, 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 nuclear uh, boundaries, sorry, uh, cytoplasmic boundaries between these cells, which is another important feature. Obviously, pleomorphism won't have a role here because if you are dealing, for example, with a clear cell uh, grade one, then you hardly have any pleomorphism in these two these cells. But if you are uh, dealing with a higher grade, then you might be lucky. So yes, absolutely correct. Uh, now, uh, this is a clear cell carcinoma. And, uh, and this, is, this is a nested uh, vascular trabecule in between. And uh, this is what it is. Now, the question for you guys will be the same question, okay? Uh, the first thing is that, how do you, can it be anything else? Okay, some of you said dancogranulomatous inflammation. Um, the dancogranuloma can come in frozen section in the kidney situation. And a lot of people, when it comes, they call it uh, AML uh, because they see uh, a lot of uh, spindle cell proliferation uh, with blood vessels and things. And then, then they tend to call uh, um, a tumor, uh, you know, uh, uh, the zansogranuloma AML. Uh, but this is not good enough because zansogranuloma, by definition, it will grow into the tissue around the kidney. So you will see fat, you will see some spindle proliferation, which are histiocytes, and you, but it, the clue will be the zansometer cell. Uh, the zansogranuloma, I wouldn't put it in the differential here because this is of course nested. And the other things as well, that it has got distinct cell membranes. But the zansogranuloma in general won't be that confluent. You know, you don't see a lot of clear cells like what you see in middle of the field now. The zansogranulomatous inflammation is, 
is this vacuolated or, or, or cells that you tend to see with abundant cytoplasm in the middle of an inflammatory cell infiltrate, heavy inflammatory cell infiltrate actually. Go back to the xanthogranuloma in gallbladder in the, or any xanthogranulomatous inflammation you saw in the skin uh, sometimes uh, the you know you it, the xanthogranulomatous cells or these vacuolated cells with vacuolated cytoplasm they are not a, a the, you, 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 they are they are one of many but you, you they are not confluent and they are not nested uh, some of you said adrenal uh, uh, gland uh, um, the thing is that you, we have to go back to the history and what the history was that this nodule is definitely on the kidney okay so this was a kidney nodule so if you if all if you have a stamp thinking about clear cell uh then so granuloma you know you say uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma uh, adrenal cell carcinoma clear cell ovarian you know, some people have that template that they brought it when they have attended some lectures, and then they go and uh, spell it out on the exam. Uh, I wouldn't uh, go that far. Now, one thing I would say about the adrenal gland, the adrenal glands tends to be more sheets, and they don't tend to be nested. Or, or, or has got this rich vascular trabecule around them. The, the adrenal rest uh, usually set on the surface, as I told you. The, the examples of the adrenal rest that came in the exam uh, was, was um, uh, adrenal rest that was seen in uh, the testes. Okay, so you have a testicular. A frozen section, and then it was an adrenal rest. I the adrenal rest uh, usually is uh, a, a very small things, and it usually will fit into a slide. By the way, okay. So uh, just uh, remember this because uh, uh, it is it is very important uh, because the the it is like. Um, some spindle cell tumor, which I always tell my registrar, if you think that your tumor fitting the slide for, for when you wanted to call it sarcoma, but you see the entire tumor inside your slide, then ask yourself again, why do you want to diagnose something that small as malignant? Okay, but what, is it, what I mean by this, that it's important as well to, to understand adrenal rest is an encapsulated lesion. It is uh, usually, when you see it, it usually fits onto the slide and it will have uh, the zonation. Uh, some of you said zonation. No, this degradation of staining, it's a frozen. Your eyes has to get used. But the fact that this is a nested, clear, distinct cell boundaries, and uh, the vascular trabeculae that's present around this nest, I wouldn't, and you are in the kidney, and I wouldn't dare not to call this clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Uh, it is, I, as I started the session, I told you guys that you have a level of confidence that you have to apply. But remember that some of the teaching session uh, tends to focus more on uh, some of the teaching sessions uh, tends to focus more on 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 stamp stamp answers you know they tell you if you see is an tumor put this answer if you see a clear cell tumor put these answers if you apply if you are, there's no one rule that work for all and if this if you are one of those pathologists who put a stamp answers for every questions based on the characteristic clear cell spindle cell small round blue cell uh whatever then there is a problem because 
there are scenarios like these scenarios in front of you. This is a clear cell carcinoma. There is no need to, to argue the case more because we see the nested, we see the clear cells. And then, but the next question will be, the surgeon is asking you, okay, uh, what should we do? Right? So, uh, again, now you know my, my answer, okay? So can one of you just predict what's my answer going to be, please? Exactly, <laughs> exactly, that's what it is. Yes, this is a malignant new plant. The next step in the operation, it is up to you to decide. Yes, it is, it, is not, it is not going to be adrenal because this is an intraparenchymal nodule. He said that this is nodule in the kidney. So they are not going to uh, you know, take the adrenal out of the way from your mind, this is not adrenal. If a surgeon, if a surgeon, this is a completely different scenario from the parathyroid gland. Okay, in the parathyroid gland, the surgeon cannot decide what's adrenal and what's kidney, sorry, what's parathyroid and what's lymph node. I agree. And this is one of the reasons why they send the parathyroid for frozen section. But believe me, the surgeons know what's kidney and what's adrenal because the adrenal look yellow. And if you have done a, 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 a post-mortem, you will know, okay? So don't get dragged into adrenal or not and try to, to create this difficulty. This is, you are making, you are following this, this, schema, this scheme template and I told you it doesn't work. Okay, it does not, it's not going to work here because the surgeons, they, they know how to preserve the adrenal gland during the surgery. They know how the adrenal look like uh, uh, during the surgery because this is their job that they do it every day for eight hours in theater. This is what they do. They know what's adrenal and what's not. This is not what the surgeon is asking you, okay? To get an adrenal rest situation in the exam, you will either get it as as a, on 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 a different organ in a in a, in a completely abnormal site like on the testes or on the surface of a spleen or something like this, okay, or even a small module in the peritoneum, but you wouldn't you wouldn't get it in in this scenario. So for this scenario, please don't apply your clear cell template. It is not the case to be applied for this clear cell template, okay? And please, please, yes, this is a malignant neoplasm. It's up to you to decide. Now they have to treat both parts. They have to stop the transplant. This is what will happen in real life. I'm just telling you that you are aware and they have to treat these patients and scan him and do other things. But it's not for us. In a frozen section scenario, this is clear cell carcinoma. It's a malignant neoplasm. It's up to you to decide what to do next. You need to keep doing that, okay? So tonight, when you're watching TV, or if you're going out with friends, or just keep repeating the same sentence to yourself. It is malignant tumor. It is for you to decide what you will do in theater, not for me. It is malignant tumor for you to decide, okay? I'm not going to repeat that again, don't worry. All right, we will go back to, we will go to another case. So this is a case number uh, three. And um, I, I have a 20 case open, but uh, the introductions for what we said was important today. Uh, cystectomy, so this is a cystectomy in progress for bladder cancer and the surgeon send you the ureteric margin. So, so this is uh, just to, to highlight now what is uh, we need to decide, okay? So first of all, you need to decide if you have complete sections or not. Now, one thing, 
I would urge you not to make a first impression on frozen section because the, 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 the first impression can, can distract you from what you really need to, to, to see and appreciate. Because don't forget that in here, what we need to appreciate and decide on this is that if we have a CIS, or if we have a cancer, or we, if we have an invasive cancer, or sometimes you might find some nest just sitting in the muscle. Okay, so in this type of frozen section, which is a characteristic of the problem of the urothelial carcinoma. The urothelial carcinoma, when it spreads and presents itself, it can have these satellite lesions, okay? And these satellite lesions can, can present in the adventitia even, okay? So, so when you assess this, like, like, because a lot of you wouldn't have dealt with a real cystectomy case because it's only done in a specialized center, but when, when I, I, I don't do cystectomies now, but I, I used to do them in the past and I taught how to do them. But one of the pitfalls in, in them is that, uh, is that you can get, um, you can get a, the tumor in the muscle without tumor on the surface, or you can get tumor nests in the adventitia. So for this type of, samples, the, the margin, the ureteric margin, or the urethral margin, uh, then you need to, to pay attention to all the layers, not only to the surface epithelium. So this is number one. Number two is when we, when you look into the, 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 the um, uh, ureteric things here, it is important as well to the human, it's important to decide if this was a um, dilated or not, okay? Uh, it, because if, if this was a dilated segment of the ureter, then that means that there might be a, a stricture lower down, okay? And if there is a stricture, uh, that has been instrumented, you might then start to get a, a reactive type urothelium, which you might overcall it. So this is also another thing to focus on. Now, a lot of people uh, uh, know that if you have umbrella cells, doesn't add a lot of weight to if this is benign or malignant, because there are some malignant lesion or a typical lesion that can have umbrella cells. But one, one thing I have noticed from my little practice is that the continuate, continuity of, of, uh, of umbrella cells, it tends to be more in association with a benign lesion. Uh, one thing I wanted you to, to remember as well from, from this particular case that yes, the frozen section doesn't look too bad, but the frozen section can be tricky when you assess nest in of the urothelium in, in the, in the um, parenchyma, in the lamina propria, and it can be difficult sometimes to differentiate it between the prominent vessels that's convoluted. So this is another thing. The arrangement, as you know, has to go upward. And the polarity, which can always be appreciated at the basal layer, has to, to, uh, to be um, there. But uh, the, the one and, and important thing in this, that we don't tend to have mitosis. And I did work with, with a pathologist who's very eminent, a uropathologist, who said that if you start to see mitosis in, and you're calling it benign, then simply you're wrong, okay? So 
mitosis is not a feature in the urothelial uh, tumor that you should pass it lightly. Although in other areas with the squamous epithelium, you might, okay, let it go. Uh, the, 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 the size criteria is very important. Uh, and what it is that some of the cells, and pay attention to the word some, will acquire the four or more the size of the lymphocytes present underneath in the, in the stroma. And this is important. Uh, and, uh, and it's important because uh, this feature can tell you a lot about how you differentiate the, 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 the dysplastic epithelium or the atypical epithelium. There's a lot of variation between the UK system on how we categorize atypia and uh, do, how we, we accept the word dysplasia. But I don't want, want to go into this. What I wanted to tell you that the, the CIS or invasive malignancy or normal or and reactive is your four category. So it is basically be, between benign and malignant and that malignancy, either it is a CIS or invasive or in situ. So, so the, 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 the exam for this area, for this margin is not going to tackle you for the dysplasia or the atypia of uncertain significance that's used in some of the American uh, classification. The exam is, for this margin is a ca cancer, uh, like a PTA or PT1 cancer or PT2, or uh, in terms of classification, is it CIS or is it benign? Okay, and uh, we, 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 we will, uh, so there is a constellation of features here, yes? So the, 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 again, it's not one feature that you can rely on and, and, and then see it, you know? Like, for example, you see a little bit a typical cells here present in the middle of the field in between every other cells that looks benign, then this is not right. You, if you call this malignant, then I wouldn't. And yes, if you see one mitotic figure, basal, not, not, not higher up, very basal in an inflamed mucosa uh, and you within a population that looks very normal, then I wouldn't rely on that mitosis alone. But if I see high mitosis, I will worry then. So even if it's a single one, because it shouldn't be there and then I will be worried. So I, I, I totally agree with, with the initial impression that was given that this was a benign uh, tumor and benign uh, case. Um, um, unfortunately, we, we are running out of time. We only covered the, like uh, one, the benign areas of this margin and uh, I uh, covered the, 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 some of the main, main principles here uh, into this. Um, but uh, I, think, I think what we can do is um, in the next session, we can see more frozen. If people would like to see more frozen and uh, before we switch back to the h and &E, uh, what it was important that I just wanted to highlight uh, the basic and the, the very crucial principles of benign, malignant, and defer. And, uh, and then we will be able to go through. Uh, you need to understand the reason why I cannot extend the session more than the hour, because a lot of you have got social commitment and we have to, to respect this. And it won't be fair on all of you to stay longer because you have other things to do. And uh, the, the things is what I would like you to be aware uh, that uh, uh, we, uh, I, I like the interaction. So please try to be 
uh, present life. Although, you know, I, I do put them on the link, uh, on, the, on this link on the YouTube. And uh, then, but, but just in case, if, if they are not there, please try to attend the live uh, sessions because that interaction between me and you will help us, all of us, into this. Um, the other thing is that, uh, uh, yes, my, my name is Ahmed Ali. Uh, I, I, uh, I am a general pathologist for those who may have joined uh, today for the first time. Uh, I, I work in England and um, and we are trying within this group is to to basically uh, um, uh, just to give you a flavor of, of what can go wrong in the exam rather than what can go right. And uh, I, I will um, uh, uh, put this link again uh, for the videos because some of you asked to, to, to have the link. Uh, I will also, uh, what some, some of you did ask, uh, how, how do you join these sessions? We usually send the, the Zoom link for people who are registered and I send also the link to my colleague uh, NG, uh, uh, who uh, some of you know her well. And the the um, the thing is, uh, we I I agree, I I will give you then the next session frozen again, as you guys uh, want it more frozen. Uh, what we will cover, we will cover all uh, the potentials that might come in the frozen section exam. And I will uh, I will. Um, make sure that uh, any 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 pitfalls that you might come in the exam uh, will be covered maybe uh, it might take as you you know me by now i might say oh next time but it might take two 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 sessions to be able to do something like that uh, thank you for your compliment uh, i hope that this was uh, 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 useful 